you want to All right, I'm not going to bore you guys with a bio. You know who I am, probably. Uh, my bad reputation for seeking I'm sure. So, uh, they asked me if I could talk about UAVs a little bit, so I wanted to do that. I'll let you know I'm not an expert at UAVs. I'm just a regular surveyor that tries to use UAVs. So, I'm not here with all the answers. Uh, there's a lot to learn. I'm still messing stuff up with UAVs. I even occasionally crash them. I've probably crashed more UAVs than I've flown properly. So, uh, they're a challenging tool. They're very dangerous, both from a survey perspective and from a safety perspective. So maybe we'll talk about that tonight. But my wife was telling all my scary stories before dinner. Uh, I, I've had a UAV chase a soccer mom or two kids across the park. Uh, I had a UAV. I had a UAV disappear in the sunrise and never be seen again. Um, I mean, you name it. I've done, I dropped a UAV on a used car lot. Just fell out of the sky like a stack of bricks. No warning. Sent it to them, recovered it with a, you know, traded a 24 pack of Corona for my UAV. Got it back. Sent it to the manufacturer. They never could tell me what happened. So uh, <coughs> yeah, lot, lots of the technology is better than it used to be. I started. I started with with one of the very first quadcopters you could buy in the U.S. probably five or six years ago. And uh, it's, the technology's gotten a lot better, but I've crashed a lot of them. And here's my rule of thumb. My rule of thumb is uh, you fly those UAVs, you better be prepared for them to come out of the sky at any moment. Because it could happen. And a lot of people don't know on those quadcopters, if you lose a prop, for any reason, you lose a prop or motor, the thing comes down. So I try not to fly quadcopters quadcopters anymore. Uh, we try, primarily try and fly a six prop for that reason. You can also buy parachutes for your UAVs. I haven't done that yet, but I'm seriously thinking about it. Uh, so yeah, safety is a huge issue, and I've crashed a lot of them. If you fly UAVs for long enough, you will crash one. You just, you will. So you guys know the, the, the main, the best selling UAV in the U.S. and the one that most surveyors use is the DJ, DJI Phantom. I tried for two weeks one time to get DJI to tell me how many hours I could put on those motors before I needed to worry about them conking out, and I never got an answer. What they basically told me was, our UAV is not for commercial use, it's for recreational use. So if you want a number of hours on a motor, you better buy a commercial UAV. So there's a lot of stuff to think about. Um, the other thing that, that a lot of, another misconception a lot of people have is, you hear UAV and you think like autonomously clone. You do not just buy those things and take them out of the box and go fly them. Um, I really, really strongly encourage everybody that flies a UAV to have some piloting skills with the UAV. If you don't, if you don't buy that from Amazon and take it out to your first job the next day, right? Like, there's guys that do that. Um, like you should know, you should be able to, when you go through your pilot training, your FAA remote pilot training, like you should be able to manually take over that UAV at any moment and fly it. So if you're just using the mission planning software, you're not you're not really doing your job. So there's a lot of issues. They're scary, man. I, I, every time I put one of those things in the air, I get afraid. Every time. And that's good because you know what that fear does? It makes me really really careful. The problem is there's a lot of guys. You know, the, the 24 year old version of me would have not been afraid. And that's a problem because there's 24 year old versions of me running around with UAV. <laughs> now the good news is that the, the, most of the UAV surveyors are flying are small. They're under 10 pounds. It's hard to hurt somebody with a five pound UAV. I'm not saying that you can't do it. But the main way you're gonna hurt somebody with a five pound UAV is by putting it through the windshield of a moving car. So you don't fly over moving vehicles. And by the way, you're not supposed to do that without an FAA waiver. I'm supposed to fly over moving vehicles or over people. So you can't fly over freeways with a UAV. I had my marketing department ask me a couple months ago. So I work at a big firm. We're the only office that has UAV pilots. We were at the time. We've got a couple more offices with UAV pilots now. But my marketing department is trying to do a video for a presentation on a transportation project in the Bay Area. And they asked me if I would fly over the freeway, take off on the the main city street and fly under the freeway overpass, over the tops of the cars, under the overpass. Because they wanted that video in their, in their presentation. 
but like obviously we did not do that. <laughs> but that is what your marketing department will ask you to do. That kind of stuff, right? You gotta know the rules. Okay, so what the main thing I came to talk about tonight was how good is this stuff <coughs> from a serving perspective? And what can you do with it? What what should you do with it and what should you not do with it? Okay, so I'm gonna give you give you an idea. Uh, many of you know I work for Adrian. When I work for Adrian, uh, he was gracious enough to let us do some fairly extensive testing, so I can share with you some of the results of that. Um, the other thing I think every surveyor should do, Stan Keen copied this, I don't know if you guys know Stan Keen surveyor, but uh, Stan Keen came to work for us as my as my new boss. And uh, he asked me, he said, how long do you take an RT observation, RTK observation on the control point? I said, two minutes and 30 seconds. Two minutes with a 30 second check. And he said, why, why two minutes and a 30 second check? And I said, I, I don't know, because that's, that's how I was taught. He says, well, have you looked at the difference between a two minute shot and a 30 second shot? Or a 10 second shot or a five minute shot? I said, no. He said, go take it out in the parking lot. I want a 10 minute shot, a five minute shot, a 30 second shot, and a 10 second shot. And he made me put all those observations in Excel. I had to do the statistics and, you know, and he was a giant pain in my butt. But what was he teaching me? Test, 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 test. So every time you get a new UAV or a different camera, or you're gonna run a different target configuration, what do you need to do? Test, 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 test it. Now they got these guys running around, these guys that sell UAVs, there are some slippery vendors out there. Super, so you guys have talked to them. Like, I'm talking snake oil sales and slippery vendors. And now what these guys are selling you is they're selling you RTK enabled UAVs, and they tell you you don't have to set any ground targets. Okay? That is such a lie. Such a lie. So do not believe those guys. Do not believe them. And we're going to talk about what I think you need to do for, for ground control. Okay? So anyways, I've been crashing drones for six years. <laughs> Just crashed one two weeks ago. I hit a tree coming into my landing. Yeah, I mean, you just, if you fly them enough, you crash them. They're five pounds, so what do they do in the wind? Move all over. They move all over the place in the wind. Okay, so I've been flying for about six years. I got my FAA pilot license a couple years ago. Uh, so what am I flying? We do have some four prop phantoms. I also fly a six prop uh, unique. It's a Y U N E E C. Six prop unique is the main thing I fly these days. Um, I do not fly fixed wing. I, I've never flown a fixed wing UAV. So let's just talk about that for a minute. What's the advantage of a fixed wing UAV? And by the way, who's flying a UAV in here? Anybody? Okay. A little bit. A couple guys. A little bit. So what's the advantage of a fixed wing UAV over a over a quadcopter? Anybody know? Ground coverage. Yeah, it cover way more ground. What's the problem with a fixed wing UAV? It has something that a quadcopter does not have and causes problems. Yeah, it's called a stall speed. Thank you, Steve. Yeah, fixed wing aircraft have a stall speed. So the nice thing about a quadcopter is if you run into any trouble, you can actually take your hands off that remote, and that thing will stay in. It'll stay at a certain elevation, a horizontal position, within a three foot circle most of the time. So and it'll just stay there until the battery dies, okay? Now, why do I get nervous about my party chief running a fixed wing aircraft? It's like giving him a missile, right? I mean, it's order of magnitude more difficult, right? You gotta think about your, tall, your stall speed, if you make a turn too steep, all that stuff, right? Like, there's no way I will ever give a party chief a fixed wing UAV, ever, 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 ever. ever. Quadcopters are way easier, okay? It's way safer. Okay, but yeah, you just don't cover, you don't cover as much ground. If I need a fixed wing, a fixed wing UAV to do the job, I'm flying with photogrammers. I got a great photogrammers that I work with out of Close. You guys probably know area code mapping services. Have you guys seen? Yeah, it's fixed wing, I'll just call them. They can fly, they got a big fixed wing plane, they can fly. Right? I don't have to worry about crashing. Okay, so how am I using UAVs? I basically don't survey dirt anymore for totals. At all. The only time I survey dirt anymore is if I'm in the direct flight path of a runway and I can't get clearance. So that's like anything within 20 miles of SFO and you can't fly basically. It's not quite 20 miles, but. Um, so unless it's directly in the path of a runway or I've got issues with the vegetation, I fly. So I don't 
don't survey dirt or gravel anymore, never. Okay, and I'll explain, I can explain why. We'll, we'll, when we talk about how good it is, I'll explain why that is. Um, I also fly UAV on every single land tile survey I do. And I will for forever. Unless I'm right at the end of the right at the end of the runway. So just so you guys know, they came out maybe uh, so it used to be if you were within, I think it was five miles of an airport, you couldn't fly at all. You couldn't fly. But they changed the law maybe a year ago or two years ago, they came up with a new approval system. And now now there's an app. There's actually a mobile app you can use to get approval for your flight. And you basically can fly now with certain restrictions everywhere but directly on the flight path of the runway. Like they've way opened up the airspace. We can fly a lot more now in the last 18 months than we used to be. Okay? Anybody know the flight ceiling? What's your flight ceiling with the UAV? 400 feet. 400 feet. Yeah, 400 feet. Okay? So I fly all my land tile surveys. Okay? I'm, I'm here. I'm selling you my secret sauce. So you just can take this and go with the All right? So I fly all my land tile surveys, and I don't fly them for the topo. Do you know what I fly them for? I fly them for the ARCO, okay, and I'll tell you why. I, I just had a client tell me, she told me this two weeks ago, I'm not making this up. She said, this is the nicest looking land house or bed I've ever seen. And I tell you what, it's not my wonderful drafting. They love those orthos. The, the legal, the lawyers and the title people love those orthos. And I'll tell you why. If you take somebody like my wife Monique, who's here tonight, and you give her a traditional land house survey with a total on it, does she know how to read that? You give her a land house survey with an ortho background on it, and all of a sudden her light, her eyes light up. Because that's a picture. Right? She sees the buildings, the sidewalks, the walls, the ditches, right? And so you get that, you get that in the hands of the right title person or the right lawyer, and they start asking all kinds of questions that they wouldn't normally ask because they've got that ortho background. Yes? Did you create some examples? I didn't. Come on. I didn't, but if you see it. <laughs> but if you email me, just, yeah, no. If you email me, I will send you. I have, a, I have no problem sharing. If you email me, I'll send you. Um, I can't remember the last time I did a land title survey that didn't have a UAV ortho background in it, and it's way better than now. It used to be if you had a big enough Alta, you know, if you're doing a 500 acre home somewhere, you'd fly it, right? But these orthos are. They're just, they're so much better than what you get out of an airport. Okay, so for, for small urban sites, which is what I, I'm a city surveyor now, ever since I went to work for Adrian, I'm a city surveyor. Like, it's raining, it's raining, I don't even care anymore, right? Because I'm on pavement, it doesn't even matter. So almost everything I do is, is in the city, is urban, right? If you get those high resolution ortho photos in there, like, you can count cracks in the pavement. And it's an ortho, you can measure on it. It's it's really good. Okay, when I say city, I'm from Montana, so when I say city, I mean Livermore. So I have flown a site. Yes, we have flown a site in San Francisco. So uh, so a couple issues, obviously, uh, you can't fly with people. Okay, so. Uh, if you're going to fly something in San Francisco, you, what time, what day and time do you fly? Sunday at 7 a.m., right? And like, there's issues with that because you get, you know, there's lighting issues. Um, I have, I do land, landscape photography on the side, and that background helps because you got issues with exposure and uh, what they call dynamic range. And just got to be careful the time of day messing with you. But yeah, you can't fly with people, so you, you got to be careful. Um, but I have flown a couple jobs. I would be really nervous about flying downtown San Francisco. I probably wouldn't fly it. You know, the build, you get buildings and wind, you get wind issues in those urban canyons. And the, uh, there's guys that are doing it. I can guarantee you, there's guys probably doing it. Someone will crash a drone into a San Francisco skyscraper at some point. I just don't want. Yeah, it's already happened. Steve said. Yeah, so it'll happen. So there are some limits, but you know, 90% of what I'm doing is surveys of a huge shopping center. You know. It's, Five stories, it's the tallest building. It's all flat, urban hardscape. And yeah, easy, just fly. You know this parking lot, Sunday morning at 7 a.m., there's no one here, right? So you can fly that. So um, I have had a couple jobs where they put like industrial things that ran 24 hours a day, and like we had to fly in, we had 30 minutes to fly at shift change. 
You know, they got shift A out and they held shift B for 30 minutes and that was our window. So those are, those are things to think about. So, I'm flying to UAB once a week, let's call it. So pretty regular, right, yeah. You're flying all your customers too, right? Flying, well, so we'll talk about that in a minute. So all my men, I fly all my men on surveys, I fly all of my dirt cobos. Okay, so Adrian said one out of our total, so we're going to talk about that. So, how good is it? I'm going to give you some numbers. This is what I'm willing to put my signature and seal on if good procedures are followed. I will stamp these numbers at the 95% confidence level. Okay, so two signals. All stamp plus or minus 2,500 vertical, and all stamp plus or minus. That's what I'll stand for, two signal. Because I've tested that with the total station. And I'm pretty confident I can meet that. That's on urban hardscape. Okay, that's low altitude urban hardscape properly controlled. And we're going to talk about what I think that means. Okay? So here's the rule of thumb I give people. Now, I don't want you to go out and do a survey and say, well, Landon said it was good in two tenths. You test it, right? And every time you get a new new aerial platform or a new camera or a new software package, you need to test it. Okay? But I've proven to myself that I can do this. So this is caveat that we'll talk about. Okay? That's pretty sneaky good. Here's what I tell people, this blows my mind. You can take a Chinese drone with a two hundred dollar camera and get that out of the software. That's mind blowing. I mean, t you know, 15 years ago, that took a million dollar plane and a half a million dollar camera. And you didn't even get that good. You weren't even that good. So here's what I tell people. In my mind, that UAV is like RTN. It's, it's about the same level. Okay? So now, I, I, I'm an RTN hater. I hate on RTN all the time. I think it gets way misused and abused. Okay? So I tell people in my office, we only do two things with RTN. Search for boundary, not ties for boundary, search for boundary, and dirt topo. That's it. You can't do hardscape design topo with RTN. You can't. It'll burn you. Sometimes you'd be okay, but you get burned. I had a guy do it. He did RTN topo. He was going around the block. So he started here on Monday, and then he was working around Tuesday, Wednesday. Everything was fit. He was checking good as he went around, and when he went to close the block, his elevations were a half a foot apart. Because that RTN accuracy drifts, it kind of follows a sine wave with the satellite configuration, right? So if you catch it on, if you catch peak and valley, if you catch it worst case, you're going to see that difference. So that's what I tell people, it's about as good as RTN. What do you think my civil engineers want me to do all the time? And it's cheap. What do you think my civil engineers want to do with that stuff all the time? And it's got a beautiful picture. So you can get something to an engineer, it's got a beautiful picture, and it's cheap, and what do they want to do with it? Every time. What kind of design? Hardscape design. Twice a month, i got to have a discussion with my civil, and what do I got to tell them? You can't use this for hardscape design. And half the time, they're trying to trick me. They say, later, we want you to fly a UAV out here. And I say, what are you doing with it? Oh, nothing. <laughs> no, we just want the ortho. I'm like, no, you're lying to me. You're going to design sidewalks with that thing. I already know it. Okay? It's not good enough. And that doesn't mean it won't be good enough one day. But think about it. You're going to put a cheap $1,200 Chinese drone in a $200 camera. You know, are they ever going to cut this in half? I don't know. They might not. They might not ever cut it in half. So here's, here's the interesting thing. It's better than a traditional aerial. So a traditional aerial you get at national map accuracy standards, I think is one half the contour interval. Right? So, you know, on a, on a 20 or 40 scale aerial, you're getting one foot contours. What's your plus, what's your vertical national map accuracy standard? Plus or minus what? I've got some young guys I te I've been teaching. You know, I'm sure all you guys do too, right? I've got a bunch of young guys who, or gals who are trying to teach. And I had them ask me one time, how come the photogrammetrist only gives us the center of center line of the curve? They don't give us top face and they don't give us flow line. Well, there's a reason. What's the height of the curve? What's, this, 
what is the vertical precision at two sigma? He can't give you the top of it. He can't tell the difference between the top and the bottom of the curve. That's why he gives you the center line of the curve. If you got a photogrammetric with traditional aerial photography giving you the top and bottom of the curve, I'd be worried. Right? Because I don't know if he can give that to you for the spec. Right? I'm not a photogrammetrist. Maybe, maybe some photogrammetrist is going to see this on YouTube and leave me a nasty comment. Maybe he says, oh yeah, I can do that. But yeah, that's the spec they got to be most of the time, plus or minus half a foot. So we're half that. We're half that. But it's, it's not good, you know, plus or minus 2,500 unless you're in, you know, Denver. You know, I work in the valley. How flat am I? You know, this ain't, that ain't going to work. Right? I'm, I'm worried about a couple hundreds sometimes on the site. Yes? It depends on the surface, too, because if you have black asphalt, it's all smooth. Yeah. The algorithm does yeah. not deal with Yeah, that's area. good. Yeah. See, yep. It, the surface of the asphalt will come into this fuzzy yep. band that's. I've actually cool. seen what Steve's talking about on a site in flu in uh, Emeryville. And you, when you looked at the point cloud, so you get a point cloud out of this software. When we looked at the point cloud, the, the black asphalt looked like this. It rippled because of what Steve's talking about. It's fuzzy too. Three, four tenths thick. Yeah, it's fuzzy. The point cloud's fuzzy. Yeah. Okay. So what Steve's talking about? One of the things that the UAV needs. So I, I told you, you had, I got some caveats, right? So one of the things it needs is the UAV does better with with more variation. Because what it, what the software's doing is it's looking for key points. Okay. So for example, if you took a picture of this wall, this right here would be a key point because it, what it, it can see these edges and it can find corners. Okay, so this is a key point right here. You know, it's gonna have a hard time right here using this as a key point. Why? Anything on here? What? Too close. Too close together, right? These windows will be great key points because what color is this stucco? Black and white, good contrast right here. It's gonna grab key points on the corners of the window frame. The more key points you have, the better job it can do fitting your images together. Okay? Yes? Back to the question. I do fly all my topos because the because the background ortho helps the drafters, and it's not just the background ortho; it's the obliques help the drafters. I just don't want the wrong people to get a hold of the data. So actually, I've had obliques. I've had oblique photos save me a trip back to the field because you got something the guy didn't shoot all the points, so you're not sure. You know, they coded it funky, and you're like, "What is that?" And you're not really sure. You can pull up the obliques. Yeah, so it's good to have. So how long does it take, do you think, to put that UAV up and fly a 20 acre site? How long do you think that takes? 20 minutes. I can fly a 20 acre site in 20 minutes. One battery is 20 minutes. I flew 2,500 feet of road in, I'm trying to remember what it was, Martinez. 2,500 feet of a little country road, uh, I flew it in 40 minutes. So here's the real, well, well wait, we'll get down to about how to change the business. So how good is it? It's pretty stinking good. It's pretty stinking good. Okay, now, now I'm going to scare you, okay? So let's talk about ground control for a minute. I am the only person you're going to meet in your life that's going to tell you the truth about ground control with UAVs, okay? Everybody else is going to lie to you. So this is the truth. You need a punch. If you want to get this, you need a punch. Okay, so here's my rule of thumb. Five on the die, that's the best. Five on the die. Right click. Did, did this technology change the fundamental principles of photogrammetry? No, didn't change it. Five on the die. You start pushing it more than 500 feet apart, you're going to have problems. Now you think about a big site, you got to have a target every 500 feet. That's a lot of targets. I've flown, I've flown, so here's my rule of thumb. If it's more than 100 acres, I probably should be doing it with a UAV. That's my rule of thumb. I've done it up to 200 acres, but it wasn't because it was cheaper, it was because it was faster. And we'll talk about that in a minute. Okay, but if it's over 100 acres, the number of targets you're setting is going to eat up. You know, two man crew time is expensive at a union firm. The number of, at some point, the number of targets you gotta set kill the, kill the efficiency of the photogrammetry. So I would say the sweet spot for us is 
between five and thirty acres. That's that's the sweet spot. You know, you can do you can do a ten acre site with ten targets. You know, that's that's doable. Okay, so about five hundred spacing. You can experiment with it, pushing it, pushing it farther or closer together. But that's a good that's a good rule of thumb for me. Uh, but you gotta have targets. Now, if you want this kind of capture to be out of your UAV photogrammetry, can you set your targets with RTM? Because what are you doing to the vertical on your targets? It's trash. So I guarantee you there's guys out there running around with the RTN setting targets for their UV aerial. Why are they setting them with RTN? Because it's easy. Okay, so they're going to double or triple this number right here if they're setting their targets with the RTN. Okay, now my boss will argue with me about that a little bit because he likes RTN. <laughs> and we've done some testing where it's come out. Okay, but I'm a skeptic. I think I think we got I think we got lucky a couple times. But you got to do your own test to find out. So anytime I'm doing UAV photogrammetry and I want to hit these numbers, you got to set your targets fast and accurate with the tool station. Those are the two ways to do it. I suppose you could do an RTN and level through it, but that's yeah, you know, I don't know when that would ever be worth the worth the money. Okay, so you got to have good ground control. So we set. We set targets kind of with this rule of thumb, and then we always shoot ground control, not ground control, ground truth. We always shoot ground truth. And the nice thing with the UAV is you can shoot all kinds of stuff around you. Into parking stripes, corners of sidewalks, okay? And we do not fix those as a general rule in the software. We let those float because those get used to QAQC after we've got the aerial. And if you want, I'll send you the little QAQC workflow. But there's like four or five different places we check that at, right? We check it in the photogrammetry software, then we check the finished ortho, then we check the, then we check it in CAD, we check it. Every time we move to a new software platform, we check it. Because a survey tech will move it. They'll have it in international feed or in the wrong zone or stuff happens, right? But it looks, it's beautiful. It's beautifully beautiful in the wrong zone, right? That's not what happens. Okay? So, let me tell you the bad stuff. The software will lie to you. It will lie to you, it will lie to you, it will lie to you, it will lie to you. It will tell you you have a great least squares adjustment on all those targets, and it has lied. And this has happened to me over and over and over. I believe the software, and we ground truth it, and I'm off four feet. Or I'm off two feet. I just did a job in. Sunnyvale, the software told me it was, I had a great adjustment, it was like 600, so it's 95% confidence. I hit every target 600, and I had a shift of five feet on the south edge of the project. And you know how I found out? My guy was doing the drafting, and he's drafting along, he's drawing the fence or whatever we're drawing, and he sees a silver Honda. And then he goes over three feet, and he sees another silver Honda. It looks just like it says, What's the chances there's an identical silver Honda parked right next to this other silver Honda, right? So he said, Landon, come here and look at this. And I went and looked at it. And as soon as I saw it, I'm like, we got a problem. That's what, that's what we call ghosting. That's ghosting, ghosting in your image. And sure enough, we started looking around, and we had a problem with one of the targets, and yeah, it was off by a feet. Okay, so the software will lie to you. Now, I don't fully understand why that is, because I don't fully understand everything that that software is doing. But the, the moral of that story is do not take that stuff out of the software and just use it. It has to be checked. And you're a surveyor, you know how to do that, right? Check it, check it, check it, check it, check it. So the software will lie to you over and over again. Do not believe it. Okay, you have to ground truth that stuff. When those guys are selling you that RTK UAV that you don't have to use ground control with, what am I thinking in my mind? How do you have any clue that what you got is good data when you're done? If you don't have anything to ground truth it with? I don't know. How do you know? So I flew a quarry. Where did we fly the quarry? It was over, it was on the north side of the, like Santa Rosa. It was in Santa Rosa somewhere, their big rock quarry we flew. And I'd never flown anything like that. There was a thousand feet of vertical difference from the bottom of the quarry to the top of the hill, right? And I got my butt kicked. 
Like we priced it at 10 grand and I spent $40,000 because I've never flown the site with that much vertical relief and I needed twice as many targets as I had when we flew it. And then we spent two weeks trying to fix it without going back out to the field, right? And like I ended up going back out to the field anyways, right? And like I didn't get fired, but I probably should have been fired. Right? Now listen, I got on the phone with the engineer that hired me to do this job because he was ticked. <laughs> He's like, so you're three weeks late and you're 25 hours over budget and what the heck? And here's what I told him. I said, look, I said, we're learning. I've never flown a quarry before. I've never flown a, a site with 1,300 feet of vertical relief at 2,000 feet. I said, yeah, I messed it up. I said, if you don't want to take that risk, then let's just call the photogrammetrist from now on. I said, but you're going to wait six weeks, and he's going to charge you double. And you know what my civil engineer said? He said, you need to figure out how to do this, because the guy down the road is doing it. Our competitor, right? So part of what the conversation I was having with my engineer is like, look, when you're doing this kind of stuff, and you're doing new stuff, you know, one out of 10, one out of five, what's going to happen? Things are going to go sideways, boss. I don't know what to tell you, right? Like, that's just a risk you're going to take. If you don't want that risk, don't buy a cheap Chinese drone with a $200 camera and try and do surveys with it. It's just, you know, that's part of the deal. So I have had this stuff go really, really bad. And I, it's not the last time. I'm going to do something new with it. Like, you know, I've never flown three miles of freeway with it before or railroad corridor. Like, I'm going to do something new, and I'm going to get burnt. Right? I went out and flew an interchange in Salinas, a proposed freeway interchange. What do they grow over there? Is it lettuce? They grow some kind of row crop over there. And on one side of the freeway was this huge field. There was no plant in it. It was, what, I don't know what to call it. It was furrowed, tilled, right? You know, beautiful dirt, right? And it was huge. And so we flew it because it was just planning level, conceptual design. I didn't set targets. They just, we just flew it because it wanted an ortho background. You need to fly that into the GPS and get a plus or minus, you know, five feet ortho and still looks really good. So we went and flew it and I brought it back to process my software and I couldn't process anything on the west side of the freeway. And Steve knows why, because he told you already. Right, what's the problem with that tilled field? Not enough contrast. And so I had I had, you know, 42 images and they all looked the same. You couldn't, and the software didn't know where they were at. It just completely choked, right? Now, did I, if I had to ever go, and do, if I'm ever in Salinas again, flying a UAV, I'm gonna be like, throw some traffic cones out in the field. We need some, we need some variation out there. Something, you gotta do something, <coughs> eight hills, I don't know, something. Because if you just fly it with just the, the furrows in it with the dirt, it ain't gonna work. Now, how do you know that until you've done it and got burnt? I don't know. Like, you just learn that stuff hard. Here's the other thing, too. You know what you get from the, the UAV? You get the tops of the trees and the tops of the grass. So I got called to do, we got called to fly the UAV for a site in, uh, you guys know the America Center in Santa, I think it's somewhere by San Jose, Santa Clara. They built this huge shopping center out on the, like, the tidal flat. And the whole thing is, the whole thing is sinking. So they said, hey, we want you to go out and fly the UAV. I said, no problem. The whole site's covered in, 18 inch grass. So I told the client, I said, hey, if you want the UAV, you gotta mow. They said, we're not mowing. I said, okay, we'll do a ground survey. Here's that price. They said, we'll mow. I said, great, that's great. It'd be great if you got out there and mowed. Because what are you gonna get with 18 inch tall grass? Top of the grass, is what you're gonna get. Okay, here's something else that'll burn you. Now here's what Pix4D will tell you. They'll tell you all you need is five targets. And you can fly, you know, they'll tell you, fly as big as you want, when you got five targets. It's a lie, it's a lie, it's a lie, it's a lie. Okay, so here's the other thing that'll burn you. You go out, your engineer tells you these are the limits we want, right? And so that's that's what you do, you go out and fly. 50 50 chance the engineer is gonna call you after the flight and ask for what? I just need a little bit on the other side of the road, Landon. You know, in fact, here's what I do. When I we did our ortho, we always fly it too big, and then I go in and crop it. So the talking monkey in here to see the picture where where it outside the limits. 
right? Now I can't put this on YouTube because it's a trash talk. <laughs> so we go in and we crop it out. And they'll ask for it. They'll say, hey, because they, they, they know what I do now. They say, hey, man, I don't even crop that. <laughs> I need the other part that you didn't show me, right? Okay, so here's, this is a rule of thumb. I'll learn this the hard way. You know how far you can get outside your targets before your, your freaking accuracy really starts to crap out, in my experience? It ain't much. It's not much. It's right beyond the edge of your targets. Now, if you're in here, you're okay. Right? But if you try to go down here, just, I mean, it craps out in just a few feet. I'm going to tell you a story real quick. This is that same job I did in Sunnydale where I had the ghosting. I'm going to tell you why I had the ghosting. So I had a flag shaped lot like this. So this is like, I don't know, 15 acres. And there was a little, little driveway. This is the public road over here, and there was another public road, and they made them put in a little fire access. This isn't very, this is 10 feet. And I didn't have my coffee that day. And when I laid out the targets for the crew, this is what I did. Five on the die. What did I forget? shots over there and you're going to give it to them and they're going to be off two feet. I'm talking feet. Feet. Okay, you can actually see that when you look at the software, if you look at the edges, you'll see at the edge that will, at the end of the image you start to get distortions. Okay, the other thing that happens to us if you fly a really tall building, it doesn't have to be that tall. We flew a site, this is like a five-story building right here. Okay, and you'll notice at the edge you get this little, it looks like water mark on the edge of the building because they can't handle that vertical difference. And you have to go in, there's a way to go in and call it mosaic editor. You can go in and clean that up. But you'll get that distortion. So listen, if you're getting watermarking like that on the edge of the building, how good are these shots on the sidewalk right here? Probably not very, probably not very good. Okay, so that's just some practical experience. I guarantee you there is a surveyor in 2020 that is gonna buy concrete from a UAV telephone because he did something wrong. Guarantee it. 